This is the DeFi Decoded Podcast by Nine Point Partners in cooperation with Prophecy DeFi. The ideas and opinions expressed in this podcast should not be taken as investment advice. Always consult with your financial advisor before investing. Hello, and welcome back to another episode of DeFi Decoded. This is going to be our last episode for 2022. The next time you hear from us, it will be a new year. As uh, humans, we tend to view the start of a new year as a time for a fresh start, a time to you know, begin again, to set new goals, and to reevaluate our lives, and in the case of investors, our portfolios. Despite the fact that the arrival of the new year is actually no different than any other passage of time. We're still living in the same world, following the same routines. Nothing actually fundamentally cha uh, changes. But as human beings, I think we're inherently drawn as a species to round numbers. I think it feeds our desire to create order amidst the chaos of nature and make sense of the world around us. January 1st, I think, is a really appealing number. You know, day zero, an opportunity to start again. So in the spirit of uh, fresh beginnings, we're uh, delighted to welcome Tom Dunleavy, who's a senior analyst at Masari. Uh, his primary focus is on layer ones, as well as the relationship between traditional finance and crypto. Prior to joining Masari, Tom worked in investment consulting at Makita and investment management at SSGA. He studied finance and earned his CFA and CAI charters as well. Um, so, you know, he's a CFA who lurks among us, kind of like myself. Uh, Tom, we're uh, delighted to talk 2023, but we also want to talk 2022 as well. And welcome to the show. Thank you for having me and thank you for the introduction. So I didn't have to run through that uh, myself, but I appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. So before we get to day zero and looking forward to 2023, why don't you just tell us a little bit about yourself first, um, you know, how a CFA ended up uh, becoming an analyst at Musari and the kind of deep dive work that you're doing in crypto today. Sure. So as you mentioned, prior career in investment consulting, investment management, uh, being in those fields, you see not only the largesse of traditional finance, but the costs and uh, real lack of opportunity for upside. You have people fighting over basis points nowadays when in crypto, you're fighting over double digit gains uh, every day. So just the opportunity from that perspective was really interesting, not only on the upside, but also um, sort of stripping out a lot of the, uh, the issues and costs we see in legacy finance today. I just started researching, writing on my own. Um, primarily since 2017, but took it more seriously during COVID, um, as I think a lot of people used that March, April period to, to really explore what crypto was all about. And um, made the jump over to Masari about a year ago, and it's been, uh, it's been a real journey. We've uh, built the research team out. We've built our data and analytics team out. We're working directly with on-chain data with the subgraphs uh, team, and, and really we're just uh, leveling up everything we do and try to provide more transparency uh, to users and provide another level of research and insight to both retail and uh, institutions. Yeah, that's really interesting. I mean, I've gone through the research that you've written, and it's 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 good stuff. It's stuff that actually would be quite useful for an investor. Things like you know, how do you what's the valuation case for say an exchange token, for example? But you're also looking at um, some deep dive technical things as well. How do you decide what you're going to focus on? So, as a team, we think about things in sort of quarterly cycles, and we really think about what are the big themes going to be that we think are going to, to emerge over the next quarter or two. And then we really discuss as a team how those themes can emerge, what the investable opportunities could be, and decide to write uh, you know, sort of a deep dive piece um, somewhere in the quarter and, and kind of monitor it as, as uh, things develop. On top of that, we also have uh, sort of weekly briefs based on sector coverage and sort of try to think about it like uh, a lot of our clients, what a lot of our clients are venture capitalists, hedge funds, or just retail investors. And if I was sitting on that side of the table, I would want an expert who's spending 50, 60 hours a week looking at layer one protocols, telling me what themes are emerging, telling me sort of the differences that they see between them because they've studied them for so long um, and, and sort of giving that next level. So we try to do that for layer ones, layer twos, um, a few of the emerging themes that we'll talk about, uh, like Web3 infrastructure and such and provide those to our clients, along with a level of sort of uh, timely news uh, that we'd like to call sort of alpha notes, which is, could be any sort of uh, update topic, you know, optimism launches a governance token or something. We have uh, some coverage and some perspective and insight around that as well. So, um, you know, my primary focus, given my background is layer ones and macro. So that's where I try to try to hang my hat. But, um, you know, there's a lot of areas of interest that are, that are emerging that it's it's hard to, to not at least discuss, but uh, not my primary of, of writing focus. 
Well, it's so interesting and because a lot of the themes that you write about are things that um, were in the news in 2023, right? Um, you know, the, the com competitive L1s, Ethereum uh, migrating to proof of stake. And, uh, and some of these other sort of macro topics around the, the collapse of some of the better known centralized exchanges, lending platforms, and so forth. So what we promised guests uh, or promised listeners uh, on this episode is we would do a bit of a 2022 post-mortem. Now, Andrew and I have spoken at length, frankly, about um, FTX and Voyager and Celsius and the rest of it. And uh, we'd love your perspective on that. But before we get into that, why don't we talk about some of the, the good things that have happened in 2022? Like, what were the, the milestones from the past year where you said, okay, this technology is moving forward. These are really important long-term to the vitality of, of Web3 in the broader crypto world. Yeah, so this is uh, something I've been thinking a lot about as we close out the year, uh, especially as we worked with Ryan to write the theses for this year, which are coming out, uh, depending on your listeners are listening to this uh, towards the end of December. A um, few of the key things that I think, you know, really got glossed over. I mean, the first big one is the merge. If you told people that yeah. we, you know, we successfully executed the merge with literally no hiccups, uh, you would have had people jumping for joy in the beginning of the year. Uh, you would have thought there would be sort of an outpouring of uh, investment, institutional adoption. I mean, we all know the narratives, uh, you know, environmental flood is gone, 5 to 6% yield, issuance down, deflationary asset, blah, blah, blah. All things that make it really attractive. I also like to think of ETH as sort of, uh, you know, the oil for blockchains and sort of sort of like the environmentally friendly oil for blockchains now. So you're buying sort of a commodity that has a has a has a claim on a piece of um, you know revolutionary sort of technology infrastructure and all the underlying things um, between that. So that should be really investable, but you know because of the subsequent collapse of multiple exchanges, bridge hacks. Um, it's it's been a challenge, but I think we should not forget that the merge was a big deal. It will continue big deal and it gets us further and further down the ethereum roadmap um, mm -hmm. one of my core theses now is that the longer this bear market plays out the more that ethereum has a chance to pad its lead and get further down its roadmap i think Vitalik said we were 55 percent through the ethereum roadmap after the merge we're going to have withdrawals in march we're going to have dank sharding by the end of the year you know by the end of 2023 it's likely ethereum is as fast and as cheap as most folks really want it to be and at that point, all of the other L1s are really sort of playing for a second. So the merge is really important. Um, you know, fraud's being gone from our industry. That is, it's it's hard to say, but you know, this this might have been a good thing. If SPF was able to uh, sort of provide some regulatory capture, capture DeFi, if he was able to buy Coinbase or uh, you know get um, further exchange listings in the U.S. as he was uh, seeming to do. That would have been a potential really big issue as we hopefully get to the next bull market. Um, you know, it also highlighted the importance of decentralization and things that we should have been focused on a long time ago, like proof of reserves. There's no reason all exchanges, centralized exchanges, shouldn't provide some level of proof of reserves. So I think we'll see that going forward. Um, a few others, you know, institutional adoption. I, you know, I think it's the institutions are coming as a meme. Uh, I think that a lot of people think is uh, you know silly at this point because they've been saying it for years. But you know, I think this year we actually did make some real progress. And it, it's boring progress, but it's the stuff that's actually going to get incremental flows into the industry, which we need to actually continue to progress forward. So we have you know big folks like BNY adding custody, we have BlackRock adding sort of Bitcoin um, for institutional investors. You know, Meta, uh, PayPal just announced the other day that they're um, you know going to uh, coordinate with MetaMask. Um, you have other things like Bitcoin and 401ks, which again, boring, but brings in price indiscriminate buyers. It's one of the reasons you've seen the equity market trend up over the past 20, 30 years. Um, you know, you don't need, you know, putting aside sort of easy monetary policy, you have you and I and everyone else who puts it in sort of passive target date funds every two weeks, you're buying, buying the equity market. There's always a background bid for equities. Uh, you know, we'll start to see that with crypto as folks start to put one, two, three percent positions in Bitcoin and Ethereum and others. Um, the most boring change for institutional adoption, I think, is the updating of accounting standards, which sounds really trivial. But you know, in the past, you had to MicroStrategy and others had to hold these assets as intangibles, which means they can only mark them down and couldn't mark them up until they were sold. So that provided a really asymmetric bet if you were going to invest in crypto, in crypto um, as an institution. That has changed um, and will be implemented in 2023. So that's another big. Um, 
sort of milestone along the way. A few others, but you know, those those are the ones that really jump out to me of sort of real positives in the background that hopefully should build, um, you know, lay the groundwork for the next bull market. Yeah, yeah and one thing, uh, I mean, Alex and I sort of constantly are talking about um, the what what's the next wave of sort of infrastructure and, and L1 blockchains look like? Um, I mean, it, it seems like in 2017, it was all about Ethereum and maybe to a smaller extent, EOS to a certain extent. And then the last the last uh, bull market cycle was uh, sort of driven by the uh, scalable thesis in terms of uh, you got things like Solana, Polygon, Avalanche, um, where they're focused mostly on scalability over security and and sort of these alternative ecosystems built around um, built around use cases that leverage the fact that um, there's now scalability built in. Um, what do you think the next sort of, I guess, specifically to L1 thesis will be? Um, do you think it'll be a return back to Ethereum and, and maybe like layer twos? Do you think the uh, scalable alternative L1s from the past cycle sort of recover and lead the way in the next one? Or is it this new uh, new breed of some sort, maybe like uh, we always talk about app chains built on Cosmos and things like that, uh, that could be like the next big sort of infrastructure uh, provider of the, of the next bull market wave. Uh, I'm just kind of curious, what, 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 do you, what are your thoughts on that? And, and uh, yeah, what, what do you think people should be looking at that they're not? Yeah, so I'll start with app chains versus L2s. So in my mind, you know, what we saw DYDX do, we'll see a lot of uh, chains do in the future. So why do you move from uh, an L2 to an app chain? It's limitless flexibility, it's interoperability, it, uh, removes the need for, you know, bridging. Um, but also you have the opportunity for value accrual to your token, uh, you know, to provide, to gain some sort of monetary premium like Ethereum has. You also have the opportunity to capture MEV, which is captured sort of at the sequencer level at the L2. So for all of those reasons, it's, it's almost a no brainer to move to an app chain if you don't care about the security of Ethereum, which if you're a large financial application, you should, and you probably do. But for new app stars, for new upstarts, why wouldn't you try out the Cosmos ecosystem and hopefully gain some monetary accrual and hit that flywheel? Um, and if Cosmos figures out sort of their token mechanism and the chain is able to grow in value, it, be, it, it gains some level of security that's a fraction of Ethereum, whatever that is. Um, but I, I continue to think L2s, uh, you know, potentially will, uh, you know, continue to expand, will work on interoperability, will branch into L3s so you can have more of those uh, customizable features that you have in Cosmos. Um, but it depends in my mind when that next bull market and cycle comes and when and if those app chains want to move over to capture that premium. Um, to, to address your second question on sort of newer L1s, so, Aptos, Sui, uh, their real primary functions are trying to be extremely fast. They're largely still very centralized. No surprise there if you've played out the Solana story. What I think is novel and interesting about them is they use a new language called Move, which uh, sort of rethinks Solidity. It provides some investor protections at the base layer that uh, eliminate reentrancy bugs and a lot of other issues that we've had in the past that have led to hacks. Um, so you know they, those they, they have functional capabilities that are that are more sort of nuanced and interesting that I think folks give them credit for. Uh, you also have the ability, at least on um, Aptos, to have quick upgrades. Uh, so that is, they can push upgrades to the network very quickly, and that keeps them sort sort of relevant. And this is an issue Ethereum is obviously having. You have to go through this whole social consensus to go through the you know Shanghai fork and the Cancun you know hard fork and and, and basically you know try to coordinate these massive upgrades every um, few months. The the problem with something like Aptos and Sui right now is actually getting people to want to go there and use them, mm -hmm. and uh, you know getting level getting comfortable with some level of, of centralization there. I don't think you can completely rule them out yet just because I think move is actually a step up from solidity and is, is a novel mechanism, but do people care about that? Um, we'll see. If you find 
application that sort of hits on Move or on uh, Aptos or Sui, you could see a large influx of users. We obviously haven't seen that yet, but you've seen it on other chains. You've seen it with you know DeFi kingdoms on whatever Phantom and um, you know Kravida and Avax. You know you, you and those are games, but you know you could have sort of a novel application that gets a whole influx of users that makes the ecosystem flywheel start to to move. Right now, it's not moving the right way for for at least Aptos. Yeah, one of the themes that we started the year out with was that um, demand for block space or demand for state was going to be in short or was going to be in high high demand. Um, and so, you know, there's going to be always opportunities for new protocols that that service the need of developers and users. Um, and in a bear market, obviously, um, it seems as if both groups, developers and users, can kind of take their pick of the litter. And maybe it makes more sense to build an um, you know an existing legacy platform rather than say starting out on something new. To your point. Um, and I think that the com the comments around the Cosmos ecosystem are really are really interesting. Uh, I think others will follow DYDX. I, we spoke to Sunny Agarwal recently, and I remember the quote. I've actually wrote it down, and he said basically, as an application, the only way to protect yourself from someone else's governance drama is to have your own chain. And it strikes me that that conversation you were just describing about Ethereum is a good example of that. If you want to truly be the master of your own fate, that's uh, the only way to do it. Now, the, the concern around that, of course, is uh, security, right? I mean, you don't have the benefit of the mothership, so to speak, um, you know, with Ethereum. And so you've got to come up with some other way to secure your chain. And what the Cosmos team has talked about a lot is this idea of shared security, which is basically of all these validators, they're going to um, be validating across various different chains. So if they decide to do something nefarious on one chain, they could be sort of penalized or slashed. Uh, for what they're doing on another chain, right? And it's sort of, like, sort of like this strength in numbers concept of, well, if there's all these different stakeholders connected to many different networks, that acts as a shared layer of security. But anyway, I'm just wondering what your, what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, and I think it's a great concept. The issue is the market cap of Cosmos versus the market cap of Ethereum is uh, you know one fiftieth or something like that. So that, that level of security is still uh, markedly lower. But if the Atom token starts to gain value, that that conversation obviously changes. I think it really hangs, um, you know, I think shared security is very important. It's very interesting. And it's something that'll set the Cosmos ecosystem apart. But I think the Cosmos ecosystem needs to fix the value accrual problem for the Atom token. It needs to fix MEV because, um, you know, large players in the ecosystem today, like Osmosis, are not bought into the, the current uh, proposed solutions. Um, and they'll, they'll, have, they'll have time to do that now that the bear market is continuing to play out. But you know, I think those things have to be a priority for Cosmos in the near term as they continue to push forward and they continue to try to challenge Ethereum. I, I do think they present um, an interesting use case that's different from a lot of the other chains. You know, If you think about just the major L1s, Solana is trying to be extremely fast. Um, you know, NASDAQ feeds, blah, blah, blah. You have upstarts who are going to try to compete with that, Aptos and Sui, obviously. Um, you know, you have sort of EVM clone chains, I'll call them, uh, you know, Phantom and um, Near and uh, AVAX, you know, primary activity and all those chains is really on the EVM side. Um, they don't pr provide sort of a uh, differentiated use case. You know, what's different about all those other chains um, versus the EVM, except the EVM, you get more security and you just have to wait maybe another year before you get the speed and costs you, you need, which is you know a little while, but it sounds like most folks are getting comfortable that the Ethereum devs can finally ship. So you know, Cosmos presents something different. So that's why I think as an investable theme, um, it's interesting. The value accrual to the token needs to be solved still. Yeah. Well, we, we want to get off Cosmos because it's not a Cosmos show, though we do seem to talk about it a lot. Um, I think that the idea with them is that Atom itself is not like ETH. It's not like a base layer that accrues value the more things that are built on top. It's just one of many, which may, that, that architecture may be the wrong architecture, frankly. But um, their idea would be, you know, if it's not the value of Atom that acts as sort of like a security guarantee, the market capitalization it's sort of the, the aggregate value of the whole ecosystem. So all the tokens connected through IBC can serve the same purpose. And um, that's true, but still the aggregate value of all those tokens is still much, much smaller than Ethereum, um, even on its own. And so yeah. it remains to be seen whether or not that kind of a model can scale, I suppose, to, to what you're describing. Um, just to go back to something you mentioned earlier, which I thought was really interesting, the merge, again, to your point, like we totally agree with you. Andrew and I probably did three merge episodes in, you know, 
March, April, May of this year saying there's this thing coming, it's super important. And then when the merge actually happened, like we've like practically popped a bottle of champagne on the show. We had um, Anthony DiOrio is one of the co-founders of Ethereum on to talk about it. So it's something that we felt at the time was a big milestone. And, and today at least feels like ancient history, but I think it's legacy. It's gonna be long lasting obviously for the ecosystem, but also into 2023. One of the themes that I've written a lot about in the last few weeks is this idea that the, the path has sort of been cleared for greater enterprise adoption of public blockchains. And a lot of the discussion around enterprise blockchain historically has been around companies trying to build implementations of private permission to chains like Hyperledger. Now, I think everyone realizes that's not a solution. And instead, the best way to participate in this technology is to build on public shared infrastructure like Ethereum. And now the, the, the conditions are perfect for that to occur. And there's a few reasons for that, like the merge um, and the removal of uh, proof of work for proof of stake, uh, I think completely eliminated any kind of ESG hangups that a big company should have when experimenting with Web3 tools, like say NFTs or stable coins. And that's important for a lot of consumer facing brands because they've got customers and shareholders and stakeholders that they need to answer to. So that is gone. Um, also it clears the deck for all these other upgrades to the Ethereum network. It's a big, you know, overhang on uh, the on the asset. You know, you come from a traditional financial background. Typically, when there's some huge overhang down in the future, it keeps a lid on on the value of that asset, and that I think has now been removed. And obviously, the change in the supply dynamics is an important part of that. Uh, but also, it feels to me like there's a certain sort of corporate and institutional level of comfort with public chains that there hasn't been historically. And I think the bear market might prove to be this period of time where we start to see more and more big companies doing work in the space. This isn't a new trend. Obviously, for the last year and a half, we've seen LVMH, Nike, you know, PepsiCo, um, you know, uh, Dolce & Gabbana, all these different brands, you know, doing stuff in NFTs and, and other and MasterCard, PayPal, and Square, of course, on the stablecoin side. And so I, it's not a new thing, but it feels like this is one of those trends that's going to act as a big tailwind into 2023. Have you guys uh, done any work on that? What are your thoughts? So generally we like to do work on those specific verticals when those releases do come about and, and have sort of uh, discussions around them. But in aggregate, they all are very interesting. And I think you continue to see the proliferation of them across different ecosystems, not just one. You know, it's Starbucks, it's Reddit, and those are as different companies as you could you could sort of, uh, you know, think of. So, you know, you need continued flows into the ecosystem to continue to, to grow the space. And these, uh, these companies are sort of leading the way. It's becoming, you know, we're moving the Overton window so that it's becoming normal where, you know, Ernest & Young is now, you know, has a big focus and has for a while, you know, Fidelity, uh, you know, Harvard just wrote a paper about, you know, Bitcoin and Ethereum as a potential reserve asset. It seems this bear market, despite all the FUD, you're moving the Overton window for all of the institutions to make, if nothing else, Bitcoin and Ethereum become normalized uh, as part of a portfolio. Uh, it, this still drives me crazy. When I turn on either Bloomberg or CNBC, they have Bitcoin, Ethereum, and then they have like Ethereum Classic and Litecoin, which I, I still don't get those last two. But, you know, it's in the zeitgeist. Bitcoin it's in, yeah, Bitcoin Cash too. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. What, are we, what are we doing here? Sometimes you see Ripple too. Yeah, it's like, what are, what are we doing here? So um, those have become normalized. And I don't think people look at you sideways anymore if you say, I have a five, 10, whatever position uh, in Bitcoin or Ethereum, where I think people struggle with the use case is sort of the longer tail of assets, which do provide value. Um, and I think have a lot of novel, interesting use cases. Uh, you know, we have a lot of ideas in sort of 2023 on, on sort of the long tail of assets that we'll chat about as well. Hmm. Interesting. Um, I'm curious, uh, not to shift too much to macro, but it is something that uh, we've talked we've talked a lot about. Um, given, um, I mean, I'm not sure if you sort of uh, follow the macro stuff too much, but it seems like we're starting to get quite a bit of easing on the inflation front um, over the last couple months, um, and um, and it's looking now like maybe there'll be one or two more hikes, and then uh, mo most of 2020. Uh, three uh, will be kind of just maintaining or even potentially cutting. Uh, I'm curious, what are your thoughts on uh, like how, I guess, what, what's your take on the macro environment and and more specifically, how, how do you think it impacts 
sort of crypto moving forward as we get into kind of the, the Bitcoin halving in 2024? Man, I almost forgot about the Bitcoin having. We still got that to look forward to, I guess. Do you think that's um, something that people will look forward to? Like, I, I don't know. I, I'm like the thing is priced. It should be priced in. Like, it's something that it's. Can... It doesn't seem to ever be priced in, though. It, it, it does seem like crypto follows this four-year cycle. As much as we want to complain about how it doesn't mean anything, um, at least historically, it seems to always uh, sort of herald the start of the next bull market for whatever reason. And uh, it's just kind of interesting because. The current uh, the Bitcoin halving is at about 16 months. So next April or next May, I believe, next next May. Um, and it's just kind of interesting because that lines up with when a lot of people think the Fed will pivot to cutting rates. Um, and so it's just it's just kind of an interesting coincidence. But I'm just kind of curious if it's something you thought about or just or what your thoughts are. No strong takes on the happening, um, other than I think it's more of a behavioral and sort of mean phenomenon rather than an actual, uh, you know, fundamental flow driver. Like I think the merge yeah. should have and could have and still can be. Um, macro, more, okay, good. Uh, well, it, you know, I'm sure there are people who feel differently. But um, <laughs> yeah, looking at macro, so we have we have a lot of things going on right now. So wages are still strong. Unemployment is still very low. If you look at more of the real-time indicators of unemployment, those are starting to pick up. Um, you know, non-farm payrolls and other things are, are sort of lagged, which is, you know, one of the things that the Fed is really looking at right now to see if they can execute a soft landing. You know, can we keep uh, inflation down? We've seen the prints come down. Can we, uh, you know, make sure we don't lose too many jobs? Um, the, the best indicator for whether a recession uh, is coming is just looking at sort of the yield curve. So the long end prices and growth and inflation. Um, and if you look at the three month, 10 year yield curve, uh, which has been the most predictive of recessions. It's been inverted for the past two months. That usually precedes a recession by six to nine months or so. So that would land us in around Q1, Q2. And that recession indicator has uh, been 100% spot on. So to no deviation there. So we likely can expect some sort of recession early next year. Bitcoin and Ethereum still largely correlated to macro. So we are likely to see some more pain in those assets. Um, you know, we've seen a little bit of a decoupling, but I think that was more because we saw, saw sort of a, cap, uh, a capitulation of, uh, you know, sellers in, in sort of May and then um, as equities drip down, it doesn't matter. We also have the Fed withdrawing an enormous amount of liquidity, which I think people seem to forget. They're withdrawing almost $100 billion a month, rolling down their balance sheet. If you look at liquidity uh, conditions and conditions um, or sort of the correlation with equity returns, as liquidity goes up, equities go up. As liquidity comes down, equities come down. So you're going to see a lot of uh, pain, I think, in the next you know three, four months. Um, hopefully, that gives us time to shake out all of the, the issues with uh, crypto and see sort of a, a rosier second half of the year. But I, you know, I think we're still in for some trouble, especially in the, in the broader economy. Yeah, I think you're probably right. I also get the feeling that we're in this period where the end of 2022 reminds me a lot of the end of 2018. The capitulation this year actually hasn't been quite as horrific as it was back then. Like I remember having bids on Ether like from 100 down to like 50 bucks. I got hit on almost all of them. Um, like that's kind of insane when you think that it started the year at like $1,400, right? Um, and, um, you know, this time around, weirdly, at least those two leaders that you described, which I think have become normalized and therefore trade a little bit differently than the rest of the group, have been have come down 75, 80%, which is obviously like horrible. Um, you know, that combined with the volatility makes the asset, you know, I think not, at least this year looks particularly bad, but it is something that it's certainly far less than the drawdowns we've seen in, in some past cycles. And also um, it feels like sort of we're at this year end stage where everything's going wrong. You've got a combination of bad catalysts, a weak macro, and then tax loss selling. And I, I can't help but feel that this could mark the bottom. But having said that, we could end up in a scenario where the bottom just gets hit and then gets retested for 10 months. And I don't know if it's the mimetic value, mimetic value of, of the happening or whatever, or something more fundamental. I would tend to think the latter, frankly, that pulls us out of it into a, a next cycle. But it could be that, you know, you could be um, you could be right now, but you could be rewarded very little for, for being early, frankly. Um, and that, you know, you could find opportunities to buy back into the market 
at the same price sometime down the road. That, if I were, I'm not, it's not a prediction, it's just an observation that feels very similar to uh, the end of 2018 in, in that respect. Um, anyway, so, so moving on to some sort of uh, big themes for 2023, uh, we started the year talking about, so, uh, the beginning of this year, talking about a few big themes, the, you know, the L1 discussion, the uh, merge, um, you know, the, uh, so some other, I'm trying to think what were the, uh, DeFi as a, you know, DeFi and other chains, I think those are some of the things we talked about at the kick, kick off 2022. So going into 2023, I'm wondering, like, if, what are your top three industry trends that you're interested in? Not so much, you know, on-chain data or trading or investment flows or anything like that, but underlying Web3 use cases. We need use cases. That is a that is the issue. I mean, the biggest use case of crypto today has been stable coins, which have been an effective use case outside of the U.S. and us as uh, North American investors. I know you're sitting in Canada, but um, you know don't really feel the pains of the the U.S. dollar based system like others do. So that's been the most effective use case to date. In 2023, uh, watching a few things: decentralized social or really just on chain identity which yeah. I think the name decentralized social is really horrible with uh, sort of sold down tokens being not my favorite name, but you know, Vitalik can uh, do it, do what he wants. He's he's earned it. Um, those are protocols like Barcaster, Lens, ENS, uh, you know, Polaps and things like that. I think building on-chain identities unlocks un under collateralized lending, which yeah is really needed for the liquidity within the ecosystem. Right now, everything is sort of over collateralized, over collateralized if you're doing any lending, um, which constrains liquidity, constrains uh, the flow through throughout DeFi. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just writing it down. Yeah. So this this also brings up a new sort of uh, you know sort of vertical. I know we like to put acronyms to everything, but credentialing as a service. So these are protocols that provide the infrastructure um, for protocols to issue sort of on chain um, credentials and track those as well. So there are a few protocols here, Galaxy, Gateway, among others that are that are interesting to look at. Um, we just released a piece on, on those today. So, but the big theme of decentralized social is building an on-chain identity and using that to um, either, you know, get loans or provide some sort of reputation score in a DAO or, you know, do all of the things that uh, your regular identity maybe could do, but decentralized, anonymous, um, et cetera. So that's, that's an important one. Yeah. Um, I know people have been talking about gaming for a number of years, so I hesitate to to say this one, but we had over a billion dollars, over $2 billion invested in gaming in 2021. We had um, 170 million invested in 2022. Most AAA games take three, four, five years to actually build. So you've, you know, talking to VCs in the space, so they are very excited about the actual games that are coming to market from those investments in previous years. And you have a number in sort of alpha and beta releases, Alluvium being sort of the big one um, that just came out with their alpha release, which looks fantastic if folks haven't played it yet. There are five to 10 more that are coming in 2023 that we can expect, um, you know, really sh should be sort of AAA light games and really keep the crypto uh, sort of to the second level and the fun at the forefront, which I think has been the issue with most games to date. It's been like, you know, like Axie, how can I farm and make a ton of money and, um, you know, outsource yeah. this rather than, hey, let's play and, and sort of have fun. Um, last one I'll mention is just tip in proof of physical work. Uh, we're trying to make the D pin acronym work, which I don't know if that's going to happen. Um, What's that? This is, what is D pin? Decentralized physical infrastructure. So okay. it's using crypto incentives to try to build uh, like helium. This, helium. So um, yeah, exactly. So helium is a great example. So helium's a you know building wireless networks and five G. You also have Pollen Mobile that's doing something similar, but you have this whole other range of the stack that you're trying to decentralized. So compute networks, you have, you know, Render and Akash doing that. Um, you have storage networks, Airweave and storage are doing that. Uh, sensor networks, HiveMapper, Timo are doing that. So that's, you know, HiveMapper is decentralized Google Maps. Um, trying to build all of those things using token incentives to try to reward people who are actually putting in the work. That market today is only sort of a $3 billion market cap. If you look at across all those protocols, if you look at that in the legacy world, that market is five, ten trillion dollars. So the opportunity there is absolutely enormous. The so, issue with the yeah, sorry, I, I have a follow on to that. So 
For things like decentralized storage or compute, we we actually had Greg Osuri from Akash on the show before, and I've spoken to some people about this, and you know they'll say there are a few benefits to that. It's um, it could be cheaper. Uh, it'll certainly be more uptime because it's decentralized, and also it's censorship resistant. So if there's information that you know gov a government or somebody wants to censor, if it's on this kind of a network, it's hard to shut down. And because it's something that's decentralized, it could live forever. For so for certain kinds of information that you don't want, you know, necessarily being stored by some corporation, um, like Holocaust records, for example, um, that it's really useful to have it on a decentralized network. So I, I understand that very clearly. Um, and in and on the the helium example, like I understand the idea there as well. Can you talk about? You just mentioned one that I I wanted to hear the the use case for it. So Hive Mapper. So Google Maps, we already have like maps of every and, and street views of like every place in the world, right, on, on Google Maps. Now you are using this centralized service and we can maybe talk about well, the downsides of that, but like, what's the, why do we need a hive mapper <laughs> out of curiosity? I said the same thing uh, to one of my colleagues who brought it up. I was like, why? We have the internal debates that we're having here that, uh, you know, before, before okay. this every week. Good. So it's good. I'm not crazy. I was like, I was, yeah, I was like, why do we need this? So I didn't realize, you know, Google Maps, a lot of the businesses have, have to actually pay to be on there. Um, so, you know, that's a money making service for Google. You know, people have to pay for that. Hold also, on. the Sorry, an example. So, like, if I go onto Google Maps and I see, like, you know, McDonald's, not McDonald's, I don't know, like Joe Blow Coffee Shop, like, they may have to pay in order to appear on the map. Is that what you're saying? Or to update them their listing, or to list their phone number, or to do all of, uh, the like yellow the value, things. Basically. Yeah, um, I, I don't know what the fee is off the top of my head, but there's there's some level of fee extraction that Google actually builds in there. Um, then, uh, lost my train of thought. Um, oh, also, these maps only get updated every so often, so six, twelve months. If you can have a network of people driving around sort of every day in their cars, uh, rather than have this $500,000, which is what it costs, Google car that goes around and has to do you know, every street in your neighborhood, you have you know, hundreds of cars with these little hive mapper devices that can just assimilate all of that data and provide a low cost uh, fee. The, the other issue, which uh, you know, we have in a bear market is the incentives are not very high right now, you know, to get any of these tokens um, is, is, you know, not very meaningful, but as the market, it's, it's a flywheel both ways, uh, you know, as the market continues to go up, it'll be more uh, interesting to actually drive around and, and, and sort of, uh, you know, map your neighborhood. Uh, Demo, the other one that I mentioned is actually, you know, it's sort of like uh, progressive, if you've seen the commercials where you um, opt into putting it in your car and it provides real time updates on the condition of your car, uh, you know, sort of the check-ins you've got, um, any issues you've had with it. So this makes it very easy to sort of tell someone exactly what you've done with your car and resell it or provide, um, you know, you voluntarily giving your data so you can, uh, you know, extract some, some level of service. Hmm, interesting. Yeah. Um, I think one, one other thing um, I just want to, before you go, I, one thing we've, talked a lot about on this podcast, even though we are a DeFi podcast, um, is been kind of the use. <laughs> I mean, we try to be, we seem to be, we, we're DeFi and then sometimes we're macro and then sometimes we're L1 infrastructure, but, um, uh, and then sometimes crime experts. But um, the one thing we do, uh, we do talk about at least from time to time, particularly because it, it really did thrive the last bull market cycle um, is NFTs. So I'm curious, where, where do you see NFTs going in maybe not the next 6, 12 months, but 24, 36 months? Um, it's been something that I feel like a lot of people have lost a lot of faith in, but there does seem to be sort of a, a core community that um, is still trading them, still really excited about them. So they're clearly not going away anywhere. Uh, but yeah, I'm just curious, what, what are your thoughts on NFTs moving forward? Um as, as the holder of multiple lazy lions and uh, I sold all my pudgy penguins for them. That was the worst pair trade of my life. I hope profile pictures end up coming back. But I um, I think the use case for NFTs going forward is really just um, on-chain sort of uh, verifiable kind of ticketing um, and reputation systems. So, mm -hmm. you know, the real boring use cases that we've heard about NFTs being spoken about for a long time will actually potentially come to fruition. 
but you need actual uh, institutions that drive them. So when Alex was talking about Nike and Starbucks and all these other um, you know, institutions actually thinking about using them, I think that's what really drives the adoption. Will there be another profile picture cycle? Um, I'm not sure. I think the Donald Trump NFT drop has shown us that there still is interest in speculation, even in the bear market. So I find it hard to believe there won't be interest in speculation in the bull market again. Tom, if you have an opportunity, you should check out the last episode that we reported just before this with uh, the founders of MV3. So um, she is a uh, Hollywood screenwriter who helped develop the character Eleven for Stranger Things and has a show on Apple TV coming out shortly, directed by Damien Chazelle, who did La La Land. So she's like a big deal in, in the Hollywood uh, screenwriter world. And she started a Web3 company project with her husband and her brother um called mv3 which is basically around like nft based storytelling so like you own these characters but they're not just me meant to be profile pictures or a token to get into some community benefits um they are actually meant to be assets that exist inside of a what you might call like a cinematic universe but could span into role-playing games you know video games trading cards etc and the idea is as a holder you have a role in in helping to help create stories for your character, but also you can participate in IP rights if the character ends up appearing in content. So you can think of a lot of like implementation challenges for that around you know IP licensing and payments and you know so forth. But the idea that individuals could own a piece of uh, fandom, right? Like uh, they could be fans, but also participate economically in the thing that they enjoy. To me, at least is a really powerful concept and is almost similar to NFT art in a way, uh, but it, it's something that creates a relationship with the creator and, and allows you to sort of be part of it for the, in the long term. The analogy that they use in the, in the episode is like, what if you could, you know, what if you could be you own a stormtrooper or something like it's just a stormtrooper and that's your guy and it appears in movies and there's bragging rights and it's fun to be a part of it, but maybe you make some money along the way. And it goes back to what you were saying about gaming, which is that the most Web3 games have been tokenomics first, gameplay second. And in the end, you get all these mercenaries or you get these like, in my view, the sort of strange business model of guilds. Uh, you know, it's almost feudal. It's not guilds in the in the wrong sense of the word, right? It's like basically paying, you know, having people borrow money to buy assets to play video games and then them paying back tribute to you uh, to go like basically farm these games. And, and to me, like that's a bad model for gaming. Um, it's got to be ownership and assets and whatever in-game economy that you have needs to be sort of incidental or a nice to have or, or a benefit or a bonus over, over the gameplay. So you have the gameplay first, People play it because it's a fun game. But if you're going to be spending money in, in a video gaming ecosystem or you're going to be you know, spending time earning digital goods, you might as well actually own them as digital bearer assets. That to me seems like a much more sustainable and powerful model. Um, and if you think about storytelling, similarly, it's like, you know, you can be people who are already participating in things like fan fiction. They're already you know, going to Comic-Con. They're already diehard fans. They're spending money on costumes. Like what if in addition to being fans and doing all that just because they love it, they could also have some other user uh, experience. And that user experience is sort of a form of ownership or economic participation. So I think of NFTs and digital goods in that respect as being really interesting. And I'm always thinking, like we've talked about DeFi so much on this podcast, but the, the fact of the matter is until, to your point, until we get to under collateralized DeFi where you know, you're creating economic value outside of the assets that already exist, the, the DeFi that we know today is only gonna reach a certain number of people because there's only a certain number of people that need those kinds of tools or want to do that kind of stuff. But if you can branch into these other areas and demonstrate the benefit of, of ownership and of, of um, you know, digital goods, then I think you're going to see that as, as a key driver. And I'm not saying anything new, like a lot of VCs have this as a thesis for 2023, you know, mainstream sort of using a, uh, these traditional types of industries as a Trojan horse to drive Web3 adoption or to red pill companies into using these tools. But still, I think it's a very powerful, uh, powerful concept. Yeah, I think you said it really well. It's about ownership and it's about engagement. And it's how do you get people bought into whatever you're trying to do? Um, and why did Vitalik start Ethereum? It's because, you know, his sword, uh, you know, got got taken or, or whatever. So he couldn't, <laughs> he couldn't actually oh, do that. What's the story? 
he uh, I think it was a World of Warcraft. Uh, if, if you know it, Andrew better than me, his uh, sword god that he worked really hard for was eliminated from the game, and um, yeah, that that might be a little off, but it's yeah, like no, that's. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. Is that correct. Oh, I love that. I'm going to have to put that into something when I'm working on. Um, yeah. So that's how we started with Ethereum, which is, which is great. I, the one other area that I, I failed to hit on that I'm actually really bullish on is still sports NFTs, which I know NBA Top Shot cycle, NFL All Day cycle has been um, up and down. But I think that's a way for fans actually to prove engagement with their teams. And uh, they're really just working on a lot of licensing issues there until they build new games. I think we've seen just from the sports gambling industry alone, the sports card industry uh, alone is a you know, $30 billion market, that there is a huge opportunity there for sort of these on-chain, um, you know, verifiable digital assets. So still bullish there. Uh, they're also, oh, Fan Craze is another one that just came out, which is Cricket, which is, I didn't realize is one of the world's biggest sports. Um, and then you have so rare with soccer. So all those, I think, you know, potentially going forward could start to build, uh, build out in the next market. Yeah. Terrific. Well, I mean, I agree with all of that. I think that 2023 is going to be, um, a year where those kinds of use cases for mainstream users is going to be one of the key drivers along with enterprise adoption of web three tools. And, you know, people talk about institutions as, Will institutions buy crypto as some sort of bid on the market, right? Can they absorb whatever, um, you know, exists on the sell side, drive the price up? But to me, the more fundamental concept around institutional adoption is, is in enterprise adoption. Um, enterprise adoption. And ultimately, you know, if, uh, if a company is going to make a big push into to NFTs or some other Web3 space, they may want to hold some ETH and be a validator, or they may want to, or they may need to have it for gas or to pay for transactions on behalf of users so that, you know, the user experience is flawless. But all of those things, all that fundamental utility actually drives adoption for the asset itself. So the two are not uh, distinct from one another. They're actually quite similar. And, and I think that that's going to be something that we're going to be looking forward to. I know on the gaming side, the VCs who I talked to are like very excited about you know, console quality games that have ownership components that are going to be like huge drivers of growth for mainstream users. So we'll see. But there's a lot certainly to look forward to. I think everyone's going to be happy to turn the page on, on 2022. Uh, to, to paraphrase the Queen of England, um, I'm watching the show The Crown. I'm sure you've heard about it. <laughs> she says at her speech at Guild Hall at the end of 1992 to commemorate her reign, she calls the past year an Annus Horribilis and says that 1992 is a year that, of which I will not look back on with undiluted pleasure, which is a very queen-like way of saying it was a shitty year. Um, so that's kind of how I feel about 2022. From a crypto perspective, obviously, you know, we got to separate our personal lives from what's going on in the markets. But I think that there were a lot of things that we got to, um, you know, be proud of as an industry for achieving uh, big milestones, which maybe in, their, in the moment got lost amidst all this chaos, but in the long run are going to help set us up. And then there's lots to look forward to as well. Uh, Tom, thanks so much for joining us on today's show. That was terrific discussion. Where can people find out more about you and what you're doing? Thanks, Alex. Thanks for having me to close out this um, interesting year. You can uh, find me at masari.io and all of our research data and analytics there. And uh, look for the thesis coming out soon. Yeah, great. Well, the theses, everyone should read. It's basically like required reading in this industry if you're serious about the space. And Ryan uh, Selkis, I know it's a collaboration. I know it's not just Ryan, but um, the style is very irreverent, fun to read. There's lots of great data packed with, packed with data because Masari as a company that does a terrific job of organizing information, finding it and organizing it and presenting it. And I think that's a hugely important thing in the space. So yeah, check that out. Uh, should be out soon. And then we're going to try and get you, Tom or Ryan or someone from, sorry, maybe back on in a month or so to walk through those theses and um, uh, continue this discussion. So thanks a lot, Andrew. It's been a great year. Appreciate it. I put on my festive vest today to commemorate the holiday season. But however you're celebrating this year, um, please enjoy it. Uh, be safe. Spend time with friends and family. And uh, we will see you in 2023, day zero. Take care, everyone. Bye.
The information contained herein does not constitute an offer or solicitation by anyone in the United States or in any other jurisdiction in which such an offer or solicitation is not authorized or to any person to whom it is unlawful to make such an offer or solicitation. Prospective investors who are not residents in Canada should contact their financial advisor to determine whether securities of the funds may be lawfully sold in their jurisdiction.